In the heart of Southeast Asia, Singapore has long worn the badge of safety and low crime with pride. But can we truly take this reputation at face value? On August 23, 2023, Singapore's police force found themselves tackling a string of alleged bomb threats, a situation that made even this secure island nation take a collective deep breath. Across its urban landscape, 18 locations blinked red on the radar of suspicion. The words, bomb threats, alone carry a weight that's hard to ignore. Yet, it comes as no surprise since the city-state is a global heavyweight, a hub that's always in the spotlight. And where there's global importance, there's potential vulnerability. However, history reminds us that this isn't new territory for Singapore. Behind its modern facade lies a past woven with events that shook the nation. Bombs and their stories, tales of intent and turmoil, have left their mark on this island's canvas. So, let's embark on a journey, a journey that unearths the threads of security and vulnerability that run through Singapore's history. Join us as we dissect the August 2023 bomb threats that jolted this safe haven. But it doesn't stop there. We peel back the layers to unveil past incidents, reminders that even the most peaceful places can't escape the currents of geopolitics and international terrorism. Be sure to watch till the end because the last event will send chills down your spine. A curious tale unfolded on the Wednesday morning of August 23rd in the small island nation of Singapore. Imagine this, a series of alleged bomb threats, like a shadowy web, entangling 18 locations across the island. Government buildings, embassies, and other places of interest found themselves at the center of this shocking event. The day's script had begun at around 9.10 a.m., as the police were tipped off about these alleged bomb threats. One notable location was the Environment Building on Scotts Road, a space that houses vital entities like the Ministry of Sustainability and the Environment, as well as the National Environment Agency and Public Utilities Board. As it turns out, both the National Environment Agency and Public Utilities Board had received bomb threats. A swift response ensued. Singapore's police force wasted no time, swinging into action alongside vigilant security officers. Together, they embarked on a thorough examination of these premises. The ministry also stepped up and pledged to prioritize the safety of all occupants in its building. The environment building, once bustling, took on an eerie stillness as security measures kicked in. In an email sent to staff of the ministry at 10 a.m., an emergency was declared and a lockdown was announced. Fortunately, thorough inspections by the police and security personnel revealed no security threats at the locations, bringing a sigh of relief to the nation. Turns out, this isn't the first time these kind of threats have happened. Similar sketchy bomb threat emails, seemingly from the same source, were sent to South Korea not long ago, only to be revealed as hoaxes. Yet, beneath the surface of this unsettling episode, lies a question that lingers. Was this just a malicious prank or was there a more sinister intent? The possibility of a political motive hovers, evoking a sense of déjà vu. If indeed driven by political agendas, it wouldn't be the first encounter of Singapore with bombings tied to geopolitical conflicts. To understand this, let's journey back to the 1960s, when the sounds of explosions first echoed through Singapore. A dark chapter in Southeast Asian history known as Confrontasi, or Confrontation, unfolded between 1963 and 1966. It was a tumultuous time driven by Indonesia's President Sukarno, who vehemently opposed the creation of the Federation of Malaysia. This federation united Singapore, Malaya, Sarawak, and North Borneo under one banner. What emerged was a clash of ideologies that ignited a chain reaction of conflict. Indonesia's response to this federation was anything but peaceful. They chose the path of armed incursions, subversion, and sabotage, deploying tactics that aimed to destabilize the newly formed federation. Among these tactics were bombings, a strategic move that sent shockwaves through Singapore. Singapore bore the brunt of this upheaval, experiencing a series of bombing incidents that marred the serenity of its streets. Lives were lost, and scars were etched into the city's landscape. Seven souls were taken, and 50 others were wounded in the aftermath of these bombings. In this chaos, the McDonald House bombing on March 10, 1965, stands out. The blast claimed three lives and left 33 others injured. It was an event that sent a chilling message, an act of violence that shook the very core of the city. The scene was set when two Indonesian Marine Commandos, Osman bin Haji Muhammad Ali and Harun bin Said, snuck into Singapore under the cover of civilians. At 11 a.m. on that fateful day, these two figures ventured into the heart of the city's landscape, their actions carrying a hidden agenda. Their destination, the McDonald House building. Disguised as common folks, 
they planted bundles of explosives on the mezzanine floor, near the lift area. It was a seemingly unassuming canvas bag that contained a secret hiss and wisps of smoke, an ominous sign of what was to come. With the fuse ignited, they left the premises around 3 p.m., mingling with the daily crowd. And then, at 3.07 p.m., the explosion happened. It wasn't just a blast, it was a force that altered the course of that day. The lift door was torn from its hinges, while the inner walls of the mezzanine absorbed the brunt of the impact. The very air seemed to shudder, as windows within a considerable radius shattered. The echoes of the explosion reached even parked cars, inflicting damage far beyond the building's walls. It's a stark reminder that timing can be merciless. Just seven minutes earlier, the Hong Kong and Shanghai bank within the building had locked its doors for the day. Employees, wrapping up their work, were met with a sudden and devastating interruption. A flash of light, followed by a deafening bang, a sequence etched into the memories of witnesses. The impact was so intense that pillars crumbled, exposing steel reinforcements within them. The aftermath told a grim tale, 20 to 25 pounds of explosives had been the catalyst. Elizabeth Chu, a private secretary at the bank, and Juliet Go, an assistant secretary, lost their lives instantly. Mohammed Yassin bin Keset, a driver, fought for his life in a coma for days before succumbing to his injuries. The tally of wounded souls reached 33, scattered between hospital wards and outpatient care. After the McDonald House explosion, a surprising turn of events unfolded three days later. The two Indonesian Marine commandos behind the bombing had attempted to escape by sea but the getaway hit a snag when their motorboat broke down. A local boomboat operator spotted them clinging to a plank, and offered an inadvertent rescue. Without their military attire or identification, they were picked up by a marine police boat and brought in for questioning. In the interrogation rooms, their scheme of calculated destruction came to light. Justice awaited, delivered by the High Court of Singapore on October 20, 1965, as their role in the murder of three innocent lives was cemented in history. Appeals were made to the courts but all were rejected. October 17, 1968, marked their final chapter as both men were hanged for their actions. The execution of the two Indonesian Marine Commandos posed a challenge for Singapore's efforts to foster positive relations with Indonesia after it gained its independence. In an attempt to mend fences, then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew visited Jakarta in May 1973. During this trip, he paid a poignant tribute to the two Marines by visiting the Kalabata Hero Cemetery. With a symbolic gesture of scattering flowers on their graves, he sought to extend an olive branch and promote goodwill between the nations. This act of reconciliation resonated positively, capturing the attention of the Indonesian press. The gesture was heralded as a step in the right direction, a sign of sincerity from Singapore's side. As the news rippled through diplomatic channels, it contributed to a gradual improvement in the bilateral relations between the two countries. February 10, 2003, marked a significant moment as McDonald House was officially declared a national monument by Singapore, proudly standing on Orchard Road to this day. However, the McDonald House bombing wasn't an isolated incident in Singapore's history. Turn your attention to Faber House, a 12-story office building nestled along Orchard Road. Owned by United Overseas Land, a subsidiary of the United Overseas Bank Group, it became entangled in its own story during the mid-1980s. The timeline unfolds with two distinct dates. The first, a larger explosion on March 17, 1985, followed by another on December 21, 1986. The question that lingers, what transpired within the walls of Faber House, and who was responsible for the incidents? Under the shroud of night, around 11.30 p.m. on March 17, 1985, a sudden blast disrupted the calm at Faber House. Within its walls, only the security guards bore witness to the explosions unfolding. Remarkably, no injuries marred this shocking incident. Subsequent investigations revealed that a stash of plastic explosives, scarcely 500 grams, was strategically concealed within a narrow, 25 centimeters wide drain paralleling the building's sidewall. The positioning of the bomb, shielded by a steadfast wall and neighboring shop houses, steered the blast's impact both upward and laterally. The outcome was a punctured drain and dislodged tiles from an adjacent building. Within Faber House, glass doors on the ground floor were shattered, and windows spanning six stories bore the brunt, their fragments strewn. Despite the blast, the building damage was moderate, estimated to cost less than $50,000 by UOL. Then dawn came and an unsettling phone call was received, an ominous bomb threat targeting Faber House at 9.45 a.m. that day. The building's occupants were swiftly evacuated, 
the threat met with precautionary measures. Yet, hours later, the threat turned out to be a hoax. The semblance of normalcy reclaimed the morning, as workers resumed their routines. But the question remains, what motivated this incident? Curiously, Faber House housed two diplomatic outposts at that time, the Israeli Embassy and the Canadian High Commission. But both denied receiving any bomb threats, although the Israeli Embassy was suspected to be the target. However, the bombing incident came to pass until a surprising revelation in 1991. A Palestinian guerrilla named Fuad Hassan al-Shara, who was captured by the Israeli army, confessed to his role in the explosion. His admission confirmed the suspicion that the Israeli embassy was indeed the target of the bombing. But the story of Faber House doesn't end there. On December 21, 1986, more than a year after the previous incident, another episode unfolded. At 8.40 p.m., an unexpected explosion pierced the evening's calm. Yet, by another stroke of luck, there were no casualties. This time, the blast's origin was traced to a drain adjacent to a power substation nestled behind Faber House. Yet, despite the blast, investigators remained puzzled over the absence of explosive remnants. The explosion blasted a hole measuring 30 centimeters wide and 30 centimeters deep in the drain. Astonishingly, Faber House itself emerged untouched, its structural integrity unscathed by the explosion. However, the Singapore Chinese Girls School, a mere 15 meters behind Faber House along Emerald Hill Road, took the brunt of the blast's energy. The blast shockwaves rippled through its walls, leaving fresh cracks in their wake. As fate would have it, Faber House was still hosting the Israeli Embassy and the Canadian High Commission when the second explosion took place. Once more, suspicions loomed, hinting at the possibility of the Israeli Embassy being the intended mark. Yet, the mystery was never solved as no culprits were found leaving the incident shrouded in unanswered questions. The Faber House explosions were subsequently highlighted by the Singapore government and media as instances of the early emergence of terrorism within the nation's borders. But wait till you hear about the next threat that shocked the world in 2016. In August 2016, Indonesian authorities thwarted a chilling plot orchestrated by extremists following the directives of Bahram Naim, an Indonesian ISIS operative stationed in Syria. Operating under the name Kataba Gunggong Rebus, the extremist group's ominous goal was to launch a rocket assault on the Marina Bay Sands Integrated Resort, the glamorous waterfront that hosts the bustling Formula One circuit, a luxurious casino resort, and towering office structures. The group was based in Batam, an Indonesian island just south of Singapore, which happens to be a popular tourist destination for Singaporeans. Contemplating the utilization of a hill or a remote island off Batam's coast as their launch site, the group's sinister plans were promptly quashed by Indonesian law enforcement before they could materialize. Notably, Singapore authorities had been aware of the plans to attack Singapore, and had been meticulously coordinating with Indonesian counterparts to monitor the group's activities and detain those responsible. Precise coordination between Indonesia's elite counter-terrorism unit and the Riai Islands police led to the apprehension of the alleged leader, Gigi Ramit Dewa and his crew. This 31-year-old resident of Solo in central Java, employed in a Batam electronics factory, was detained along with his wife and infant, signaling the end of a sinister chapter. The unraveling of this plot traced back to digital trails. Gigi had altered the profile picture on his LINE messaging app to feature a banner proclaiming Indonesian support and solidarity for ISIS, which drew attention on social media. If not for this seemingly innocuous act, Gigi's plan to launch a rocket attack on Singapore from Batam might never have come to light. Although Singapore has been fortunate to avoid the kind of attacks witnessed in major global cities like New York, London, and Berlin in recent years, the country acknowledges that the possibility of a terror attack remains. In addition to the challenges posed by terrorism, Singapore is actively combating white-collar crimes, including money laundering. In August 2023, the city-state busted a billion-dollar money laundering syndicate secretly operating amongst the wealthy. To learn more about this gripping story, check out this video.